My last video was on why scholars tend to be historicist, and there were several reasons, some not related to how the evidence is handled, like being employed directly or indirectly by the church because they are historicists, and the conservative nature of academic groups, and the career risks of questioning the current wisdom. Other reasons were related to the evidence, and these boil down to scholars' preference for plain reading of a text and for applying the conventional criteria of historical reliability, those being multiple independent sources, contextually consistent with what else we know of the period, the dislike of conspiracy theories, and the criterion of embarrassment. Also, I think scholars have an understandable tendency to avoid being particularly hostile to Christians. Early Christians tend to be seen as mistaken but sincere, and no doubt some of them were, as is true today. Scholars are much less inclined to view early Christians as a nest of vipers, as no doubt some of them were, and as is also true today. This is evident in the position that scholars take on miracles, which are not seen as obvious lies, or even lies that were sincerely believed, but rather as misunderstandings. Some even go so far as to say that they cannot comment on whether miracles occurred or not because that is a theological matter and they are historians or linguists or whatever. So if you take the evidence for the existence of Jesus, plug it into this system, turn the handle, out will come historicity. But in this case, applying those criteria simply and uncritically means sweeping aside a large number of cogent arguments. Arguments that maintain that such an analysis is reductivist and question whether the criteria are really applicable or are really met by the evidence. Let's look first at the multiple independent sources criterion. You cannot argue about the multiplicity of sources, but are they independent of each other? The usually cited list is Josephus, Pliny, Tacitus, the Synoptic Gospels, John's Gospel and the other books of the New Testament, and the extra-canonical Christian literature. And then the number of sources is extended further by dissecting the Gospels and hypothesising other sources, most notably Q, but also L, M and others including saying sources and sign sources. By independent sources we mean sources that originate from different independent witnesses to an event. The nuclear accident at Chernobyl is topical at the moment, thanks to HBO's mini-series on it. The history is reconstructed from eyewitness accounts and audiovisual data taken from numerous different people who were involved in the disaster and its clean-up. The multiple sources criterion applies, because these sources are traceable to different eyewitnesses. One source, Valery Legasov, is a particularly good one. He was a nuclear expert brought in to advise on the clean-up. He was reliable, knowledgeable and observed much of what happened. He is quoted in scores of reports, but he is one source, not scores. How different are the Gospels? If they end up being traceable to one eyewitness, well, it doesn't matter how many sources we have, they all boil down to one and the criterion is not met. If that one source turns out to be an ancient Valery Legasov, well, OK. But what if everything that they say that we can actually test proves to be false? Anyway, taking first Pliny, he tells us where he got his information from. He got it from interrogating Christians in court, and from interrogating a Christian slave girl under torture and to Ava that he looked up some kind of court records from the Jerusalem area several decades after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD is prompted not by the evidence, but by a desire to promote historicity. Therefore, the balance of probability supports Pliny being dependent on Christians, and therefore not being a source independent of Christian literature. Then we come to Tacitus, the successful Roman lawyer, politician and historian who was governor of the Roman province of Asia and was writing his annals in the second decade of the second century AD. These annals contain the so-called Testimonium Tacitum, in which he tells us that the Emperor Nero was responsible for setting the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD and used the Christians as scapegoats, of whom he tortured, persecuted and murdered a great multitude. He tells us that the originator of the name Christian, one Christus, had been put to death by Pontius Pilate, following which the mischievous superstition had been checked, only to break out again in Judea and spread to Rome. A lot of ink has been spilled by both sides of the argument debating this passage. But in short, mythicists dismiss it on grounds contested by historicists, and those grounds are, firstly, it may have been forged in the Middle Ages, 
Secondly, if it was not forged in the Middle Ages, it may have been referring to a group called Crestians that were not the same as the early Christians. This is because the oldest manuscript we have of Annals has been corrected from Crestian to Christian. Thirdly, if it was referring to early Christians, Tacitus may have got his information from Christians, making it not independent. Actually, both sides agree it seems likely that Tacitus did first learn of Christians via Christian sources, and at issue is whether he checked this information against public records or other historians. On the one hand, he was a careful historian and may have done so. On the other hand, he doesn't say he did, and he doesn't include any information about Jesus that does not look as though it came from Christian sources. The only possible sources we know of that were extant then were Josephus and Christian sources, and we have no indication from Tacitus' writings that he was aware of Josephus. So we just don't know. At least I don't know. Quite a few historicists and mythicists do know, it seems. For secular early sources, that leaves Josephus. I discuss him in another video, but briefly there are two mentions in Josephus of Jesus. One of them, the Testimonium Flavianum, is an obvious forgery, and it is debated whether there is a core that is original to Josephus or whether the whole thing is forged. The other is a fleeting reference to Jesus, the brother of James, who was the Christ. And again, whether this is original to Josephus is contested. Josephus was a Jew come pagan, and neither group accepted Jesus as the Christ. But even if both are granted as being true, where did Josephus get his information? This time we know of no non-Christian source that predates Josephus. Josephus was Jewish. He was born in 37 AD and lived in Jerusalem until 71 AD when he went to Rome. So his own recollections date back to Jerusalem about a decade after Jesus' death. He could have learned of Jesus in his youth, but the only people we know were talking about Jesus in Jerusalem at that time were Christians. So it looks as though Josephus too got his story from Christian sources. So what of those Christian sources? Here we have a ready test of independence, because we know from uniformitarianism, a very powerful argument, that Jesus did not rise from the dead. The claim that he did is fiction. The likelihood that this particular fiction arose simultaneously in the minds of more than one person is remote in the extreme. The overwhelming likelihood is that this fantasy arose in one person's mind, and that person was a charismatic individual who strongly influenced those around them. Comparable outbreaks of mass hysteria are well described in modern times, and they always have a single index case that starts off the epidemic. So therefore, any source that contains this detail of the resurrection of Jesus is derived from this one individual who first had the idea, and therefore that detail from the source at least isn't independent. Now, I think it highly improbable that the resurrection story started simultaneously in more than one person's mind, but even if you think it did, the multiple sources argument still takes the same hit. Because either multiple sources don't apply to this argument because there was only one source, or else the multiple sources argument does not apply for some other reason because it still comes up with the wrong result. So we can bunch all the resurrection accounts together and say that's one source because we know the resurrection was a fiction. How much else was fiction? The resurrection was not just one isolated detail but the whole point of the narrative. Was the crucifixion also fiction originating from the same source? And if not, why not? if we know the resurrection originated from one fictional source. Every Christian source we have for the crucifixion also tells us of the resurrection, and the secular sources that do not maybe don't do so because they didn't credit it rather than because they hadn't heard it. The New Testament, and the Gospels in particular, have been dissected into hypothetical prior sources. This is getting tenuous because even if hypothetical sources existed, we only have extracts from them, so we can never say they did not mention the resurrection. But at least we can identify potential independent sources, and various ones come to mind, the most prominent being the Q source. This mentions several miracles, and raising the dead on two occasions, but does not mention Jesus' crucifixion or resurrection, though it does say, he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Similar arguments go for L, the hypothetical source used by Luke for material that's not in Mark or Matthew. 
Again, this source does not include the crucifixion or resurrection, but it does include the virgin birth. M is the comparable source for Matthew, and this is confined to eight parables. So what are the non-canonical Christian sources? The Gospel of Thomas opens with the lines, These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. It's a list of sayings with no miracles or resurrection narrative but I would concede it appears to form an independent Christian source. We can apply the same resurrection reasoning to Jesus' other miracles. The Synoptic Gospels and John do report different miracles, but not entirely so. John reports seven miracles other than the resurrection. Five of these are unique to John, those being turning water into wine, healing the official's son at Capernaum, healing the paralytic and the man born blind at Jerusalem, and resurrecting Lazarus. The other two are feeding of the 5,000, which occurs in all four Gospels, and walking on water, which is in Matthew and Mark as well. All of the Gospels, even Mark, have some miracles that are unique to them, but most miracles are given to us by more than one Gospel. These miracles never happened. They were made-up stories, and they were made up by individual people. Each miracle therefore originates with one fictional source, and therefore every time a miracle occurs in more than one gospel, it means the gospels have a single common fictional source, and none of this is even counting the exorcisms. We can do this for the supernatural claims in the gospels, but we don't have the same luxury for gospel claims that do not contravene uniformitarianism. We have good reason to believe that our distinction between natural and supernatural was either not made at all or was much less obvious to ancient writers. What should we then assume for the material in the Gospels that is not supernatural? Should we take the scholarly view and default to it all being true, or should we take the legal review that once a witness has been caught lying, their entire testimony is seen as unreliable? So the bottom line is that applying the fiction that the resurrection and miracles never happened, the multiple sources argument is seriously undermined. So the next scholarly argument, they don't like conspiracy theories. Well, there is one loose here, because we have multiple sources scattered across time and space all conspiring to tell us exactly the same things that we know aren't true. Incidentally, if you speak to Christians about this, many would agree. They believe in the resurrection through faith, and many would agree that if that plank is removed, the whole edifice crumbles to nothing. Moving on to the criterion of consistency with what else we know about the period. This criterion sees off vast swathes of Christian literature. For one thing, uniformitarianism sees off all the supernatural content, something that the scholarly community is reluctant to say in as many words. Then there are various other oddities like clearing of the temple, the curious nocturnal trials, the disposal of the crucified body of Jesus in a rich man's tomb, etc. that fall foul of this criterion. But there is one particular event that does not, and that's the crucifixion itself. That was the Roman punishment for sedition. This is one of several reasons why the crucifixion is the single most historicising event in the Jesus story, and explaining it is the single biggest obstacle to the mythicist position. So we come finally to the criterion of embarrassment, which I have discussed in several videos. And this argument goes that if you are making up a religious story, why would you include a component that made your evangelism more difficult? And that component is again the crucifixion. Paul tells us that this was a problem, as it was foolishness to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews, as the Jewish Messiah was never supposed to be crucified. And yet there it is in the story, and we have to explain how it got there. One explanation is that it happened and many people knew it happened, and therefore the early Christians were stuck with the fact and had to work with it. There have been other explanations, though. The whole Christian story originates from humans wrestling with the problems of pain, suffering and death, and that may explain why a narrative emerged that centred on the best example of these three phenomena combined. But such arguments aside, of the scholastic tools that lead to the position of historicity, This criterion of embarrassment, to my mind at least, is the one that survives criticism with the least damage. If Valery Legasov had told us that Lenin had risen from his mausoleum in Red Square and appeared at Chernobyl 
entered the reactor and caused it to age a billion years in a day, uh, sorry, caused it to age a billion years in three days and three nights, causing the radioactivity to decay away, and he then ascended into heaven, well, we wouldn't believe him, would we? But of course, Comrade Legasov never said that, did he? <laughs>